Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to another episode of On the Couch with Creatives. I say good morning here in the UK, but obviously good afternoon, good evening if you're anywhere else in the world. As most of you will know now, this is part of the Creatives Group, the private network for creative professionals everywhere. We support you and help you grow, develop and connect your businesses together so that you flourish in whatever you are doing in your industry. But as I say, this is On the Couch. Julie, who have we got on the couch today? Joining us on the couch from Melbourne in Australia is Dan Monty, who has written and published 13 graphic novels and novels over the past three years. But he doesn't just draw the story's frames, he does something really quite interesting. So thanks for joining us on the couch, Dan. Thank you for having me. Well, you're doing some amazing stuff. So let's kick off by asking you first, what inspired you to write graphic novels? Well, I was always a big fan of graphic novels growing up. Um, I think my earliest inspirations for graphic novels uh, were from um, reading some of the works of Frank Miller, an American um, comic writer and artist. Uh, particularly Batman Year One and some of the Sin City books that he wrote. I always loved that he wrote and drew a lot of his own stuff. And I found that really inspiring and really interesting. And I certainly did have a crack at drawing them, but I was never, I did draw a few comics, but I was never that confident at drawing. So I wanted to seek out another way to do it. And tell us what you do. Tell people out there what you do. Uh, well, basically, I build uh, miniature sets and um, I, I put uh, characters that I have customised um, into the frames. So essentially, the comic book is is more like a, a, a diorama brought to life, essentially, with speech bubbles and stuff. So instead of drawing the frames, I'm, I'm building the frames. It's like um, a 3D comic almost yeah yeah kind of like 3d wow does it take you a long time to build your your sets for each frame because that must be quite time consuming if you're building a thing for each frame well i don't i i'm, I'm fortunate to have a lot of time in my life and I, I i do um um use it pretty well i i move very quickly when i've got an idea in my head i, I like to build sets and sometimes I, I can build them in a few hours depending on how quickly I want to do it but um yes I, I I build them pretty fast and um I paint them up and obviously they've got to dry and everything and then I can start it's almost like getting little actors to go onto the set you've got to wait till the set dries and then you can put everything on there and do all the special effects makeup that you do and so it's a little bit like making a little movie really what what materials do you use well, uh, a lot, actually. Most of the materials I use for the sets are actually items that are thrown out. Uh, um, one of the things I like to do is look around and find uh, polystyrene uh, boxes and containers and sheets of polystyrene are my favourite. It's usually used as packaging material, and I, I take that stuff and I carve into it and paint it and, and set it all up and I melt it and paint it to look like mountains and, and and the sort of creepy locations. I made one set out of an old cardboard box that my son had um, he'd use. I, I, I get him tiny teddies and twisties and stuff, and I just turned the uh, the box into a, um, a set for my um, uh, graphic novel. So I how do you start idea. the process, though? Because you obviously have to think of a story first. Yeah. Well, well, the good thing is, I mean, in the old days, I probably would have done drawings and I still do drawings a little bit just to get an idea. But a lot of the stuff that I want to do is in my head. And I'm very lucky that I've got an imaginative mind and a very visual mind. I'm able to visually see things and and literally translate that to what I'm working on. So in other words, I know in my mind what I want to build. It's just a matter of finding the right uh, materials to, in order to bring it to life. Mm. So if I know I need a, a jail cell, for example, like in my graphic novel, I need to make a jail cell, well, I need a room 
and then I'll just cut a little door into it and paint paint brickwork and um, and um, any other stuff will be done out of foam and polystyrene. And then it's just the characters I've got to use, which is usually action figures that are um, that I've just sort of painted up and and disguised and made look different and and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's it's an extraordinarily long process in some ways because it goes from conception to planning to getting to the materials and and, and the paints and everything. Um, but it rarely is very expensive, which I'm thankful for. Do you, does your son? Do you ever steal your son's toys? Does he donate no, them to you, or do you? Do you have to be sneaky and say, "Oh, I could use that character"? <laughs> I, I I I'm usually pretty sneaky about it. this. The spaceship, I think, was. Um, one of his old toys and I just sort of uh, disguised it a little bit and painted it up and changed it a little bit and um, because you don't want to have stuff in your comics that looks like it's been from something else you, you know you want to ultimately use something old to create something new and that's the mindset I'm always in with this sort of stuff I'm trying to create something new out of something old and I, I have the same process when it comes to set design I, I um I like to um, just take things that people don't want anymore and just turn it into something that I do want. Mm. And then you use the stop motion technique, obviously, to make your individual frames. Uh, it's similar with, with stop motion. I've done stop motion. With stop motion, it's um, uh, you're basically clicking. You're, you, it, it's it, it's different because you're creating motion. With comics, it's just uh, still frames. So you don't have to worry about doing all those little movements and then pausing and then pausing. And um, um, with, with graphic novels and comics, all you have to do is just come up with the scene. And then in the next frame, you show what happens next. And then so it, it's a little bit different to stop motion, but it's the same sort of principle um, in this regard because you base it's. The difference between stop motion and this is probably the same as the difference between animation and comic books. Animation is movement and comic books are um, stationary. Mm. And, and then also there's an aspect of film in it because you would have a, a wide shot, then you go to a close-up shot, then a mid-shot. Yep. And also there's green screen work involved as well, where you, you're basically, sometimes you build a set, but the characters are too big for it or too small for it. So you, what you can do is you can take the character, you can digitally remove the background, and you can actually make the set look a lot bigger than the set that you built, um, which is a lot of fun. And that's the same thing that they do when they do movies as well. Um, it, it, it's a good... and. In that way, you can use the same set multiple times because you can you can use the full set, or you can just use a small, tiny little section of the set um, and blow that up on the screen to make it look bigger than it is. That, that's the wonder of technology today, though, isn't it, um, Dan? Is that there's so many tools out there that can help you manipulate imagery now, and you know it's not all hugely expensive either, is it? No, it's not a lot of these things. I mean, these are all, app everything's done on my phone, essentially. I mean, these apps, I mean, they're all free. Um, I don't pay for the apps or anything. Um, you know, you can download these apps and, and just use them. You can shoot entire movies on your phone these days if you want to. Yeah. So technology's come a long way, and it's really been beneficial for artists like mm -hmm. me that just want to create things and get my name out there and, because I always wanted to do film, but I never really got the opportunity to get into it. The best I got was an extra job on Pact of the Rafters, which is an Australian show. But but beyond that, I, I never really quite delved into the film industry as much as I wanted to. But I've applied the physics of filmmaking into some of my own creative work. So how do you add your speech bubbles? Is that an app you use? That's a separate app, yeah. I've got an app called Pixay, which basically is designed for putting titles and speech bubbles and everything. So all I've got to have is the script, which comes out of my head. I mean, whenever I write something, the script just rolls out. Like it's it's not like I get writer's block or like some writers or I have to sit around. Like it plays like a movie in my mind. I've just got to literally type it out. So, um, yeah, and that translates beautifully onto both my books and and my comics 
So, so what is the process then? You've, you've um, built the set, you've taken the pictures, you've got it on your computer, you've stuck your speech bubbles in, then you print it and then you sell it. What happens after that? What happens is it, after it's been put into its frames and, and I, I do each shot and then I put that onto a, a separate background sheet, which is just black. So you've got three or four panels on one page and then that page is then loaded into a, um, a word processor document. So it just comes up as a, a word document. And then I transfer that to Amazon when it's finished and after I've edited it and everything. And, um, and they print it out for me. That's one of the good things about Amazon. You don't have to worry about all that sort of stuff. And that's another good thing because, you know, writing books used to be a real nightmare. Like it used to be very difficult for people to find agents because you couldn't find an agent unless you'd been published and you couldn't be published unless you had an agent. Mm -hmm. So uh, Amazon's really been a, a saviour for a lot of writers and artists. And, and I just thought that this would be something interesting to experiment with while I... Um, because I'd written books on Amazon and they'd gone very well. And then I started to think, well, what if I started to do comics? Would that work out the same way? And it did. I was absolutely stoked. Not just black and white comics, but colour, full colour comics works beautifully. And people can obviously buy your novels, your books, your comic books as well um, yep. on Amazon and Kindle. Yep, and Kindle, yep, Amazon and Kindle. Um, the uh, the Divine Madness book is available in hardcover as well. So Amazon, you know, you can get hardcover, you can get paperback. And, yes, you can get the Kindle copy as well, which is great because if you're a Prime member, essentially you can get it for free. So Fantastic. Well, let's talk about your latest books, um, The Divine Madness, which is a horror fantasy novel. Yes. And We Are Not Alone, which is a graphic novel. Tell yes. us about, give us a bit of their storylines without giving too much away. The Divine Madness was what I did first, and so I'll talk about that first. Um, it, it was uh, my first horror novel, basically. I wanted to do a novel that was uh, um, a bit scary, but not only do a horror novel, but a sort of a, with a twist of fantasy and also have it be a commentary on what it's like to be a writer inside the mind of a writer sort of thing so I, I i wrote a book about this guy who was essentially writing a book about a guy that's writing a book um so you have the, the main character is an author and then his character is also an author and it's that character's story that he is pulled into in the novel so he's pulled into this fantasy world where his character is basically this mad with power guy who makes a deal with these demon-like creatures and um, to, and this is during COVID, by the way, that this character is living in a room with his wife and he's sort of going mad and he's trying to write this book. And um, he makes a he can't control his characters. So basically his characters are seeping into reality from his consciousness. So, and the author of this book has the same problem. I'm sure there's a better way to explain this, but I'm, <laughs> um, he, he's, so, so we have two characters that have got the same problem, but one character's nightmares are, are literally seeping into reality. And, and, and basically the author of the work goes into this world um, that he's the author of and he uh, has to um, seek out the, the creator who he thinks is um, the author of the book he's writing. But it turns out that the creator is somebody else who I can't say because that's spoiling um, the story. But but it's a very complex and um, bizarre tale, as well as being very horrific and full of monsters. It, it's awesome. very exciting, but it takes a bit. When you're reading it, it's sort of you're sort of 
snapping in and out of reality. And it's very much a, a, a fantasy clashing with reality kind of story. Okay. Wow, that sounds quite epic. <laughs> and, and the other one, show us, you've got them there, haven't you? Yeah, that's the Divine Madness. And the other one is um, We're Not Alone. Now, this is much more simple, okay? <laughs> This story is basically about uh, two scientists that travel to a planet. They're, they're looking for the cure for the last disease in the galaxy. So it's it, this is the last disease, and and, and they uh, they go looking for it. And and what they discover is a planet that's teeming with life and plants. And they know that the cure is there, or they believe it is. And um, but what they encounter on this world is is a, a very dark world, a very sinister world that's full of monsters. And, and it, in a lot of ways, it echoes science. When you go looking for something in nature, you tend to get more than you bargained for, more than you bargained for. And, and uh, you know, for example, there's a scene in the book where one of the plants that they um, believe might hold... Um, medical properties actually has a creature in it that um, you know that can kill them so um and i think that's true in nature as well like a lot of the cures that we seek out come from places that could potentially kill us so there's a there's a little bit of that in the book the story as well and also there's there's these um uh, sort of primitive cannibal guys on the planet as well that um have been left and they've all gone to the planet for various reasons and so there's a lot of different stuff in the book it's a very exciting story and um it's very colorful as well there's a lot of monsters i'm a big clive barker fan i really um admire a lot of his writing and and some of the, exploring the dark side of humanity and um um, the dark desires of people and in and, and both of these books really I've, I've sort of played into that world a little bit just um, the insanity of what it is to be human and, and you know the the sort of the dark feelings and, and primal urges and, and things that we seek out in life and, and they're the sorts of things that I wanted to explore with these books um, particularly in The Divine Madness, which was really a, a bit of a tongue twister for me to write because it was very much a book inside a book inside a book. And um, and then it comes full circle at the end. So um, those sorts of stories really appeal to me mm. or, or, or did at the time. Do you think you'll do more of those kind of things? You say that the, the darker side kind of, it, are you more drawn to that? No. Um, I, I, to be honest, I don't like to go over ground, the same ground all the time. I, I've done several genres for my book, so um, and I try to make everything I do different. You know, I, I wrote a trilogy of books about sharks and mermaids. I wrote a Western. I wrote a Kung Fu novel. I did my own take on Sherlock Holmes and Robin Hood, um, which are both in the public domain. Um, so... I, I have sort of explored different genres and different styles. Um, but a lot of these ideas come out of that desire to to make films one day, I think, because a lot of these stories probably would have ended up of, as films had I gone into making films. And what are you working on now? Well, actually, at the moment, I'm, I'm taking a bit of a break. I, I, I think I've, um, I mean, I've just done 13 books in three years less than three years um and i just think that um, my creative side needs a bit of a break for a little while so i'm just relaxing and doing some model painting and um, um just exploring other aspects of my creative side mm -hmm. um but yeah I, I, i'm always looking out for new ideas and sometimes a new idea will just literally start nagging on me pretty quickly and come out of nowhere so I mean I've, I've said in the past that's it I'm not doing any more books and then a few weeks later something's 
just uh, popped into my head and I thought, oh, I've got to write this down. It's not going to leave me alone. Yeah. Do you find as a creative, you, you said you have lots of visions in your head. Like if you close your eyes, you see lots of visions and things. We had another um, comic Definitely. Uh, artist on the couch a little while ago, a chap called David Leach, who's a senior creative editor of Titan Comics. And he said that he'd only had three periods in his life where he'd shut his eyes and, and saw black darkness and that it scared the absolute crap out of him because he yes. colors and visions everywhere you know are you the same very much so um you get ideas and and, and sometimes you can't sleep sometimes you can't um um you have nightmares you know a lot of the creatures and things that happened and appeared in my nightmares actually went into the divine madness um it really is a book of nightmares in lots of ways um and i i get ideas and as i said i've got a very visual mind it's it's literally like a movie playing in my mind and sometimes it will be triggered by something as simple as walking down the street or walking um down the lake or sitting on a tram um or a bus or something um and you know um, i'm always looking at people and um and I'm, I'm i'm very inspired by the darkness of reality i think the world is a very dark disturbing place you know you get on public transport and you see a lot of people behave very erratically very strangely these days because there's so much going on in the world and we're living in a post-covid world I think it's taken a huge toll on people's lives and you can really see it you can smell it and and it's 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 terrible but it's wonderful creative fodder for a creative person because it's it's these sorts of things that inspire artists it, it's not always happiness and flowers and people skipping in the rain it's often bleakness and darkness and depression uh, and that's the sort of thing that motivates us to write these things. And, um, yeah, I, I really identify with that. And I, I feel like the world is sort of sinking in sickness sometimes. And that does sort of fuel a lot of my creative um, stories. Do you ever feel that you should maybe lighten up a bit, bring some light into the world? I, I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like mermaids I, I, and unicorns I, I i i mean i have written stories as i've said about unicorn uh, i'm not unicorns uh mermaids <laughs> you're gonna now mermaids. You know? <laughs> I haven't, haven't quite got into unicorns yet but i've considered it um <laughs> no I, I i i would like to tell stories for children in time um at the moment, I'm sort of going through this phase where I'm sort of realizing the darkness of the world. And but I, but I know I'll snap out of it. I mean, I'm reading Tolkien at the moment, so who knows where that will lead? Well, Tolkien's but, pretty dark. Well, to, yeah, Tolkien is pretty dark in, in some ways, but um, I don't really relate to a lot of the happy, joyful stuff. I mean, I don't get me wrong; I read the Bible as well but but um it's pretty dark too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not much but, happiness of the bible <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah it's i think that i find the lighter stuff to be more fictional than the darker stuff to mm. be honest it, it's it's sort of bittersweet but i think that the, the lighter stuff sort of creates a fantasy world, the illusion that everything's going to be okay and everything's going to be happy and we're all going to live happily ever after. We never live happily ever after. That's not the way the story ends. And I think that um, even when you go back to the early fairy tales, um, you, they may have, you know, um, ended up happily ever after, but they were dark stories in well, those times. Grim stories are very dark. Well, the grim stories and, um, can be pretty grim. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of and them the brothers... didn't um, end happily. You know, Disney has uh, co-opted a lot of them and given them happy endings. Yeah, but the real stories, I say, they're not the Disney The Disney stories. That's right. The, stories the brothers are grim. Dark. you got people being shoved into ovens and, you know, you... <laughs> What's that? The Little Mermaid. The Little Mermaid didn't live happily ever after and, and marry her prince. She died. 
Mm. Yeah. She, he, he married the evil witch. She she flung herself off the pier and turned into um, lily pads. That's right. Yeah. The little mermaid. You know, she didn't go back to her own world and she didn't live happily ever after. That was it. It was kaput. But of course, that's not what. Sorry if there's any Disney people out here that have got children watching The Little Mermaid. But, you know, in the story, it it didn't end well for her. She, it, she, she no, broke that's... her heart and she died. Yeah. And a lot of the old stories ended up like that. These days we're trying to get kids to read positive things with positive messages, and that's lovely, that's nice, but that's not how it really is. I mean, kids get to a certain age where they snap back into reality and realise, hey, there's no Santa Claus, there's no Easter Bunny, my parents are lying to me, blah, blah, blah. You know, at what do some you mean point, there's no Santa Claus. What do you mean? There's no Easter Bunny. Who brings me my chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> not, not to rain on anyone's parade. But... <laughs> oh, I'm in trauma now. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the, 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 I, I, I do come from a dark place, but I think we are all in a dark place at the moment, and I think we have been for a long time. It's just we we choose to ignore it. You know, people say that monsters aren't real. Yes, yes, they are real. They're absolutely real. There's monsters out there. There are monsters all over the world and they're in prisons and they're running around robbing houses and attacking people. A lot of this stuff is rooted in fantasy, but the truth is there's a lot of reality to it as well. Well, I, it's funny, I had a conversation with my son's school um, the, the other day day and my my son got bitten on the shoulder by by a kid now the the teacher explained it to me and again I'm not a hysterical parent so I could quite understand how it happened and it wasn't this particular child being horrible it it actually really wasn't um it was a game that they're playing that they've seen it it was it was a game that these these kids have seen on um the computers and they're monsters these monsters and then when the monsters catch each other they bite each other right Ah, um, so okay. of course the kids are taking this into the playground and they're running around they're going and they're not they're not biting but they're kind of gumming each other you know uh, but of course the kids get overexcited and then it goes too far and then this one kid got a bit carried away and bit my son on the shoulder it's quite a bad bite so anyway the, the teacher explained it to me and I said well yeah I, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it because I can see that it's just a game where kids got a little bit too boisterous and it got a little bit out of hand I'm not going to pillory, pillory anybody I said but We've had some situations the other side where some parents have really been gunning for my son. If my son puts a toe out of line, they're out for his blood for for whatever reason. You know, we've got some real snowflakes at my son's school. And I said, you know, the problem I have with that is that, you know, OK, school is a lovely, safe environment. As you say, we're bringing our children up to be kind and decent people. I mean, we were raised as kind of decent people, but we weren't quite so um hysterical about little things that go wrong, you know. And I said, you know. The problem is, I said, with these children, if they think that that the world operates in this way, I said, we're not setting them up for success when they leave school. I said, because when they leave school, they're going to be employed by people like me, who are my age, who are going to just expect exactly them to get right. on with it. And they're not going to be mollycoddled and they're not going to, you know, if they can't do the job, they're going to get fired. If they can't be nice to someone, something not not nice is going to happen to them. You know, they're not going to all be peaches and cream and say, oh, there, 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 how wonderful, have a gold star. It's just not going to happen. That's right. Yeah, life isn't what well, when we're children, we're raised to believe that the world is good and full of good people and stay away from strangers. And then, you know, one day you wake up and I've, I've been attacked in my life. I've had terrible things happen to me. And I was horribly naive. And my naivety, I ended up paying for in a very big way. Mm. So we raise our children to be somewhat naive. And and I think it's not necessarily a good thing because children need to be aware that the world is full of monsters. Children but it's a need fine line, aware. isn't it? Because you, you either have to give them a little bit of, of love and beauty, obviously, in their childhood. You don't want to Absolutely. totally traumatise them. No, no, of course not. But you've got I think not. I think you've got to be a little bit more aware of the dangers. Not not like aware so that it scares the absolute crap out of them when they're too frightened to go outdoors, but Yeah, you don't want to wrap them in cotton wool though. Yeah, I know what you mean. You know, they need to be aware that there's two sides of the coin, not necessarily traumatizing kids. I mean, that's 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 different. I've, I've got my own kid and I, I don't tell him dark tales or anything like that. I'm not that kind of father. I'm always you know, in, in a lot of ways, I'm echoing what my parents did for me. 
you know. But at the same time, I recognize that one day he's going to wisen up and he's going to realize, hey, dad wasn't completely honest with me. Mm-hmm. You know, the world is really scary. It's really dangerous. And, and how do I cope with that? Yeah, that's right. How do I recognize so, how do I cope with it? A lot of people think that horror, for example, is a, is a terrible thing and it's a bad thing. But one of the reasons that people are so drawn to horror is because it's being able to live out that fantasy, being able to to read about or watch it on a movie and be safe in the confines of our own home. And that's one of the things that appeals to people about horror. So I don't think, I think there's a psychological value to dark <laughs> books and, and, and scary movies. I think that we need that sort of stuff in lots of ways. So what so, age yeah, so group, I, sorry, I interrupted you, sorry. Oh, that's all right. Um, um, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, on, thought you'd, I thought you'd ended your sentence. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's quite all right. I wanted to ask you what what age group are your graphic novels especially aimed at? I mean, are they for adults? Definitely so adults. Can also access them. I mean, <laughs> kids these days. I mean, you know, there, there's kids out there. I'm sure watching horror movies and, and bad things. But I wouldn't recommend to anybody um, under the. Uh, I wouldn't recommend children read my books at all. I, I haven't written a book yet that I would recommend for children. Um, and that's why I say that one day I do hope that I write a children's book and it would would be a children's book. But I, I wouldn't recommend my children, my books. Uh, I certainly wouldn't let my son read my books, even look at the pictures of my graphic novel. And that's, you know, maybe that sounds a bit sort of protective or whatever, but I, I'm not the kind of father that wants to raise his kid and uh, uh, watching horror movies and, and reading scary stories. I, 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 There's an I, I, age my... appropriateness, isn't there? You exactly. Know, there is an exactly. age appropriateness. You know, you don't want to, I mean, and that, that's why I, I'm on my son with YouTube. You know, there's a lot of stuff and content that kids can get access yeah. to now that, that no child of a certain age should be seeing. And trying to monitor that and police it is really difficult sometimes, but um, there's a lot of stuff. Because the, when you can watch it later on, fine, but not at eight years old. <laughs> the things that we watch generally have a way of, um, particularly when we're young, because we're so impressionable, um, young kids, um, the things we watch can have an effect on our lives and can motivate us our choices in life for example if you're a kid and you're watching pulp fiction well there's you're not definitely going to do heroin but it's not going to help you know um so um yeah for that reason i don't recommend that children read my stuff um and that's because i I usually let the demons out of the closet when i write um i I swear there's all sorts of terrible things in my books that are you know um it, it, it's more about venting and I, I'm at the stage of my life where I don't care if people read all my books or not I, I would love people to read the books because that's you know one of the things I like to do uh, sharing stories but but I, I, I certainly wouldn't want young people reading <laughs> so so what are your top three tips for people like you who have movies inside their heads are very artistic can tell a good story and they decide right i want to write and uh, produce a graphic novel well to start off with um just do it it's so easy to publish through amazon it doesn't cost anything um it's it's very very easy and there's ways to find out how to do it um, there's YouTube tutorials as well. Um, basically, if you've got an idea, it's better out of your head. It's it's great to just get in there and, and just write it down in whatever form it is, whether it's a novel or you think it might be a comic, just write it down and then slowly work up the, the energy and the enthusiasm of putting the puzzle together because essentially a book is a puzzle box. You've got a beginning, a middle and end. You've got to work it all out and put it all together so it makes sense. And I've had some wonderful reviews from people that have just totally got my my story on Amazon. And, and Amazon's really um, 
wonderful it gives you good feedback and but you've got to be determined and you've got to be you've got to persevere as well mm. um perseverance is very important because a lot of people start writing a book and then they say no nah, i don't want to do this or i give up or whatever it's it's not going to write itself and it's only a matter of time before someone else writes a similar story for you so you might as well just put it down and and, and get it out of your head and it's a great way to deal with things like depression and anxiety as well. For me personally, it's it's a wonderful way of expelling demons and getting thoughts out of your head and spinning it into a good yarn that people will um, treasure or, you know, um, enjoy forever. And once it's out there, you can get author copies and you can put it on your little bookshelf and, you know, you'll never forget it. Yeah. And being good at self-promotion as well because if you self-publish as you, you touched on a bit earlier you need to be confident or get your head around the fact that you will need to promote your own material on your social media or wherever you you're at so that people know where to yeah find. i mean that that's true too um pr promotion is very very important particularly if you're an independent author i mean i recommend being an independent author because it's very hard to get into harper collins or, or penguin and most most people don't even take a chance on people anymore mm. so um I, you know don't struggle to get an agent just just work on getting known as an independent i mean amazon books like independent books get known as well the book the martian became a motion picture you know um, and that's just one example exactly so I think it's, it's, that's a, if that's the way to start now isn't it start on amazon because if you're if you have got a talent and people like what you're doing and it and you you can prove that you're a seller then the big boys will want to pick you up it's, it's the same with film you know people um production companies um streamers distributors don't like risk they only are going to push what they absolutely know is going to sell so if you've got a film if you've got a star name in it that's, that's right. a long way to get the, the sales if you've got um you know if you're a celebrity and write a book oh you'll get into waterstones and harper collins without even blinking because you're a big name the title might be absolute crap but if you're a celebrity, doesn't matter. It will it will fly off the shelves because you know whoever's um, written that book. But if you if you're if you're an unknown and you've got something to prove, nowadays I would say, say, say exactly what you said: just self publish, get it out there, get yourself known, get your sales up, get your reviews up, and then you're more likely to be found by an agent who's willing to. And it's the same with movies. I mean, the, the movie studios, you know, it's gambling. They're not going to gamble on someone they don't know. You know, um, you could send scripts to, I've sent scripts to studios and they sent them right back because they didn't have an agent. You know, um, if you want to make a movie, you need to, you know, get together with a group of friends, a camera and a small crew and make it yourself. A lot of huge movies were made famous because they were independent movies and, and they still... You know, they still make money today. I mean, um, films like Evil Dead even, which was a video up nasty in the 80s, um, but but it was essentially made with a group of friends out in the woods with a video camera. And, and it, look at it now. It's a pop culture icon. Mm -hmm. So, Well, on that note, we have come to the last few minutes of our show. Um, so we're going to play our Values Jam game which is my favorite bit. I love this. I love this. I've got this pack of cards. I've got this pack of cards and they're really soft, Dan. They're really soft and tactile and they're just really, they're real stress busters. So every time I get my cards out, Julie's like, oh God, here she goes. Because I have a little moment with my lovely little silky, my precious. It's almost as if she should get a room <laughs> with her precious. cards, you know. I like them. I like them. <laughs> Okay, so basically what I'll do is give the cards a shuffle. I'll spread them out. You'll pick a card and then we will talk a little bit about the value. So your listeners can uh, get to know you a little bit more, a little bit better um, on a deeper personal level of uh, what you think about certain things. So just tell me to stop and I'll pick a card. Stop. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have a look. What have we got? Ooh, ooh. We have got harmony. 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 Mm. 
So I'm going to ask you, because we're creatives here, I'm going to ask you creatively about harmony. What, Dan, does harmony mean to you? What does it look, feel and sound like? Ah, oh, OK. Well, That's my first reaction, <laughs> my first reaction um, was peace, just relaxation, serenity. Mm. Um, and where I feel the most serenity is probably at home um, when I'm relaxed and and in my zone, in my own little world. I think that's where I would like to be more than anywhere because the outside world is so crowded and so busy. Mm. When I'm here, I feel safe and I feel secure and I feel like I can be and do whatever I want. Yeah. yeah. So I, like I think that. that's what it means to me. What that's it amiable like? that somebody can say their home is their safe place. <laughs> yeah peaceful harmony yeah wonderful what does it sound like um what does harmony sound like yeah. i would say peace again like it, that was my first reaction it sort of sounds oh, like peace. yeah it, it just sounds it reminds me of peace it, it makes home is is really the the reaction i have to it again but your home surely isn't silent. Well, yeah, it is actually most of the time. I I, I live alone most of the time. Um, so it, it's very quiet. And um, I rarely have the TV on because I'm not big on TV. I, I stream shows occasionally. But I like solitude. I, I love to be alone. And, and I like to work alone and think alone. And I find some of the best ideas I ever get come to me when i'm in solitude fantastic so yeah peace peace and quiet is harmony for you i like that i like that well dan we've run out of time already can you believe it i, I always get to this point i'm like oh god an hour's gone already it's been delightful talking to you and thank you for sharing your thoughts with us and thank you for joining us for another episode thank you for having me it was Bye. delightful until bye. next time bye for now